we like to call it, the supernatural hour. And now, our hosts. Hey, welcome to the supernatural hour. The main topic. We, we have this thing of we don't know how to pronounce stuff on our show. Who wants to take a stab at this? I'll try it. Awesome. Because I listen to some guys talk about on it on YouTube, and they drop the silent T at the end. So Marcel Petio. I'm going to go Petio no, on that. Petio. He sounds French. He's, oh, wait, well, he, he is, is French. French. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> That's why they sound. <laughs> but I took very, you know, close, you know, yeah, the T was silent. He's a very interesting guy. He's born in like 1897 or so, and he killed a lot of people. Quite an interesting story. Doc, you want to give us a little information that you got? Dr. Marcel Petio. See, that's why you needed to do it. So A.K.A. Dr. Satan. I mean, if you're going to have a moniker, go yeah, big. Go. I can't, go, even, go I can't even aspire to Dr. Satan level. I, I don't think you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you don't. He was, he was a pretty bad dude. Yeah, you said he was born in 1897. Sounds like he had a pretty disturbed childhood. You know, based on the things that they said were going on in his childhood, if he hadn't been a child back in the early 1900s, I think they would have figured out what the issues were. They would have figured out he was a psychopath. Yeah. Well, wasn't he? He was a child of privilege, and his father kept bailing him out, you know, and that, that still happens today, unfortunately. Yep. You know. Yeah, they don't, kids don't learn consequences. When there's not repercussions for your actions. Marcel, as a child, you know, did, did small things like bringing his dad's gun to school, <laughs> uh, soliciting sex from another student at the age of 11. He was pretty messed up. I, th- I heard there was like animal torturing. Yeah, torturing some animals. Uh, all of the red flags that I think would have been picked up on in the modern era. Um, but yeah, so I was like, geez, Louise, you know, in 2020s, I, I don't think he would have gotten far. <laughs> Got, gotten that far? I would hope not. You know, the problem was, like you said, he, he never really, oh yeah, he also was like robbing things and he was a kleptomaniac and I mean, lots of red flags, but he was always, he was always bailed out. And anytime that he had evaluations, they're like, yeah, I mean, he's just crazy. And then they just let him go. He's, like he never he's really kind of, kind of mentally ill. <laughs> didn't so. really go to jail or anything, especially at, well, at a younger age. Of course, they were just like, "Oh yeah, he's just mentally ill." And so then in the go. the early nineteen teens, he went into World War One. Yeah, he got drafted by the French army. Because if you're going to draft people, you want to get the crazy ones, go right? With the, go with the crazy ones who already have experience with guns. Obviously, <laughs> don't have to train as much. <laughs> So. Well, he was able to get away with a lot of stuff because he you blamed the resistance. Oh, I'm doing it for the resistance. Yeah, that, well, that was, was a World, World War II. That was World yeah. War II. But you're 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 absolutely correct. And he used you know, we'll talk about that in a minute. But yeah, he well, a, it, a prolific liar. It kind of blew me. Away. I mean, even in World War One, I, I mean, he was stealing stuff, and they were like, "Yep, he's mentally ill," and that was about as far as it went. So eventually, didn't they? Put him in a sanatorium for mental illness and the issues after or during or after World War One. Yeah, but he got like redeployed. So he he was serving in 1917, and then they sent him to the front lines in 1918. Even after he stole a bunch of military like army blankets and got charged with theft, uh, and they he didn't really do any time there because they were like, oh, that crazy Marcel again. Yeah. Let's let him go fight on the front lines. That sounds good. You can follow up on this doc because of your medical credentials, but I think it said it took him something like eight months to become a doctor. Yeah, which (laughs) I'm sure was normal for the time, but holy cow, eight months for a mentally ill guy to become a doctor. That's uh, that's frightening, actually. Well, there wasn't as much to learn in in 1918, (laughs) I guess, either. You either chop it off or you don't. I guess that's kind of where we stop. (laughs) Yep. Yep. That's true. When you're out of leeches, you're pretty much done. <laughs> I was oh, I was reading through with his uh, with his deployment on the front lines. He shot himself in the foot, and that was kind of what led to him being evaluated again for a mental illness. And they were like, "Yep, he's crazy," and they they discharged him on disability. 
and they recommended that he be committed to an asylum at that time. But instead, they gave him an accelerated education program for veterans, and he became a doctor. Wow, what an incredible <laughs> the, program. The person, the person <laughs> that I want in charge of my medical needs is the crazy guy. We need guy. to institutionalize this guy. You know, I'll do you one better. Let's just rush him through med school. That's, yeah, scary. So let's put him in charge of something. <laughs> Oh, they do that too. Oh yeah, no, he's yeah. he's in charge of more than more than just being you know people's lives and all. Holy cow! Uh, so yeah, he ended up moving to a uh, a small village which I cannot pronounce. Villeneuve sur Yvon, or Sur Yon, I can't even pronounce it. Um, and just started uh, amassing a bunch of patients that he would uh, he would find addicts and prescribe narcotics to them because. Who doesn't just love gaggles of And then he would have them pay, and then what else would he do? Yeah, he'd build the he'd build the state as well. He would double bill and get money from his patients, and then he would also apply for uh, for like state assistance as well, uh, which is you know one of those things that sends you to prison for a very long time these days. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's insane what this guy was doing. Well, apparently there's not a lot that's going to send you to prison just, back just then. Just chilling dope to people and then double billing for it. So, yeah, Dr. Satan is setting himself up. <laughs> we haven't even gotten to the bad part yet. <laughs> oh, no, this is all. This is all. This is very tame. This is all tame. It, it gets better. Oh, my gosh. So wasn't it about this time that he decided it would be kind of cool to be the mayor? Well, yeah, I think... Uh, so I was reading that he, he ended up hooking up with one of the uh, daughters of one of his patients, and then she mysteriously disappeared. Yeah. Well, did we talk about why she mysteriously disappeared? No. Well, Go on. Um, he hired her to be like a nurse, like a, you know, like Assistant. his aide. And the neighbors, after a certain point of time, thought she looks a little pregnant. Ah, that just, might be problematic. Might be my, in a motherly way, and um, then mysteriously she disappeared. Poof. And he was—I mean, there was a lot of people that were like, "Dude, this Marcel guy. I don't know. Seems pretty suspicious." Business where they saw him moving a trunk. They were like, "That trunk looks like the one we found in the river with body parts in it." <laughs> <laughs> and despite all of that, he still—he's like, "You know what I'm going to do right now? I'm going to run for mayor. I'm going to become the mayor." <laughs> Despite the fact that, like, there's a whole bunch of eyeballs on you for a murder. And then the crazy thing is he wins. <laughs> what is going on in France in the 1920s? That's what I want to know. He was a doctor. Well, everybody voting for him was, you know, was, uh, depended on him for their drugs. All so. of his doped up patients are like, yep, yeah. now, is this we're this going Dr. Satan. He's got my vote. Is this the same yeah. time that he was saying that he was on the, the resistance? And no, that was and later still. Okay, all right, I'll be quiet. This is the, no, you're good. This, that, we're still in the 1920s, working up to the 1930s and early 40s with the war. Yeah, yeah we're, he's, he's, he's still just in training at this point. For <laughs> we're really late 20s. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. Well, the girl that um, disappeared or whatever, well, didn't really disappear, but uh, it was 1926, so we're getting to that 30s. Between the wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so Dr. Satan here, who has already had a history of kleptomania and... Mental illness. And, uh, you know, sex addiction type stuff and prescribing narcotics and double billing for care provided and mysterious banishment of people he might have been in relations with... I also got accused of stealing taxpayer money, cans of oil from the railroad department. Like, this guy could not stop. He just kept anything. He's like, oh, yeah, I'll take that oil. Let me take the taxpayer money, too. Uh, so we ended up in court again. And he was fined, and he was sentenced to three months was his sentence. But they overturned it again. Because you know, he was mentally ill? I guess he was just crazy. It's This is the mayor. So And then, and then he... He either lost the mayor or they took it away from him. I don't remember what it was. Yeah, so it says he had several more years of complaints and accusations of threat of uh, theft. This was like from 1927 to 1931. They they finally removed him from office in 1931. Uh, and only a little over a month after he was removed as mayor, he won a seat on the general council for the district. <laughs> 
like, after after all of the accusations of theft and everything else that he's done, and then being removed to, to the point like, that you're removed as basically, mayor. Basically, yeah, forcefully removed as mayor. He goes and wins a seat on the general council for the district, and he was the youngest man to ever sit in that office. But he was a doctor, and doctors oh are well my respected. Gosh, man, but wait, there's more. <laughs> but wait. Was, so then, while he was on the district, like the general council, he got charged with stealing electric power from the city, and he was fined there. And then he lost his seat and moved to Paris. So, How did he pull that off? I don't know. <laughs> a really long extension cord. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. electricity was pretty sweet back then. Um, I have no idea. Sneaking it out in his coat at night. <laughs> Just batteries and charging batteries and running with it. I don't know, but holy crap, man. It was kind of like in the 80s when we'd boost people's HBO. That's right. (laughs) We're going to splice this. So, yeah, quite the run so far. And I think we're getting kind of into this. uh, This was all like first act stuff. Okay. Intermission. Okay, go get your popcorn. Let's go get some popcorn. So, 1933. He starts growing a medical practice in, in Paris. Once he's a, done with the small town, now he's yeah. going to the big city. Oh, yeah. And, you know... Much had, more opportunity in the big city, I understand. Yeah, he had, a, he had a pretty good reputation there. Once again, was shilling drugs and making those addicts super happy. Uh, threw on some illegal abortions as well. There um, you go. Yeah. Well, you, want, you, you need to expand. That's right. It's, he keeps expanding you know. the practice. And then uh, he's, he's charged with kleptomania again. And then he's arrested for theft and assaulting a police officer. <laughs> but he got acquitted because of he's crazy insanity. <laughs> this guy. It's oh not his God. fault. Yeah. He but did. Let's st- trust him with our <laughs> medical needs, right? I know. <laughs> what? I don't know that I want this guy anywhere near me ever. They did say, finally, spent a few months in a sanitarium. But then he was released despite the doctor's doubts as to his sanity. And then he committed tax fraud a bunch of times. And then Germany invaded France in 1939. And that made it all better. (laughs) Oh, and now my part comes in. Act two. And I have to apologize. I did not research this very much because school started today, and so I've been, like, wrapped up in school. But he did tell everybody that he was on the liberation, on the, the, you know, fighting against the Nazis. He was in the resistance. Part of the resistance. Resistance. So he was on the resistance, he claimed. Yep. And that was part of the way that he, you know, he'd tell people all these fantastic things. And it's kind of a great gig because, you know, you help people disappear. That's right. There's people that wanted to get out of Nazi-occupied Paris and France. And he had quite a reputation of helping people disappear. Yeah, he charged like 25,000 francs. Francs, yeah. Money. Frank is francs. <laughs> well, and, and um that's like half a million dollars today. Yeah, and in addition to that, then he would tell them also to take all of the assets that they could and make them so that they could be carried, you know, I mean, bring them in gold or change them in, right. change them into something that can be transported because as you get out of the country, you're going to need those assets right. when you get to your new place. Before you get disappeared, bring everything of value to my that office. you have. <laughs> everything. <laughs> bring, bring bring all the family heirlooms, yeah. okay? Yeah. Sell your properties. <laughs> you're going to want that. Sell your cars because you can't take them with you. You'll just lose everything if you if you leave it here. So just sell everything that you've got and bring it here to the office with you. And funny enough, those people did, in fact, disappear. Disappear. <laughs> Poof. That was my part. Where did they go? Well, we know where parts of them went, but we will wait Ar- for that. Argentina, I know that. Right? Yeah, that was the claim, right? Yeah, yeah. Ar- Ar- they're going to Argentina. <laughs> yeah, he had quite, you know, that was kind of the, I've got a, I've got a way to get you to Argentina through... We're using Spanish resistance and French resistance to get you to Argentina so that you'll be safe there with every worldly belonging that you have ever transferred into a portable, easily scammed medium. Right. But you know what's crazy? Argentina requires some pretty amazing vaccines. You got to get vaccinated yes. before you go. Right. Must well, have that right now. Got to get yes. that get, got to get those booster shots, guys. Yeah, before <laughs> you go to Argentina, you've got to get vaccines in in 19 19- 
Right. And but so you know, that was that was the last shot they ever needed. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Only one. Well, uh, yeah, cyanide. That's their vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> After all of these people brought all of their valuables to him, and he promised to make them disappear with a minimum of two hundred and fifty thousand francs, as Jess said, was like a quarter million dollars. That's a lot. Or was it a half million? Quarter half million? million. Half million dollars. Half, yeah. In today's money, you'd give him a little little shot of cyanide, and no one ever saw them again. No, they disappeared. He did. He promised. He he got the promise. They, and the way that he would get. I mean, obviously, you start stacking up some bodies. You got to find ways to get rid of them. Mm-hmm. Right? And so you know, the bodies he would try to dissolve in like quick lime or bury them or burn them. or burn them in this little stove. I saw a picture of the little stove. He tried to to burn them in, but you'd have to chop them up into little pieces and kind of burn them, you know, over a long period of time. Hence. You end up with like twenty three bodies in your basement. Yeah. <laughs> Little body parts, really. Yeah. In, well, in suitcases. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta yeah. get rid of them somehow, so what do you do? Yeah, the neighbors actually did. I did do a tiny bit of research. The neighbors actually did call the police at one point and say, you know, it's stinky over here. And right. I think didn't the house burn down? Well, there was a whole bunch of smoke coming from it, yeah. and there was a nasty smell coming from it. So they called the fire department. And they were like, "I don't know what's going on with this house, but holy cow, there's a bunch of smoke." And uh, yeah, someone needs to check this out. So you know, the firefighters are like, "Do do do," <laughs> and he was out of town at the time. <laughs> Let's go check this thing out. He's like, "Don't go in there. Wait till I get there." Yeah. And then they waited like a like a long time, and they're just like, "Let me just go in there and." Uh, Bunch of body parts. Yeah, so the police <laughs> and the fire department essentially came and uh, found the body parts of at least 10 bodies. At least 10 bodies buried in the basement, and then they found parts of other bodies kind of. And I think they buried. said if they took all the parts, because it wasn't one, there was not one full human being, but I think they said they could make either, and I don't remember exactly, but they could make either 10 or 18 complete people with the parts that they found. Right. <laughs> But probably more than 18 people. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but they could make 18 people with them. With what Big they found match. in the basement at this point. Of, of Frankenstein's monster of sorts. Because he had he had disposed some of them in, in is it the Seine River? Yep. There in so, Paris. Yeah. He had disposed of yeah. some of them there, but it's hard when people start floating around. And so he's trying to think of a, you know, a much better way to help these people disappear completely and permanently. And the river wasn't, wasn't hacking it for him. Interesting stuff there. Well, surprisingly, um, when they discovered this, he didn't really get in trouble at first because he's like, oh, it's just body parts of the people that are against resistance and all that. And they're like, all right, that's valid. Like, yeah, because you know what? Cool with it. <laughs> like, what? I'm in the resistance and, and I'm helping. These are the collaborators and these are German people. You know, these are the Germans and these are collaborators. So. That's why they're dead. That's why I'm killing these people is is not because I'm getting 250, you know, or 25,000 francs from from them and and every worldly belonging they ever have. I'm I'm working for the la the resistance. I'm the resistance. Yeah, so he said I was a resistance fighter. Of course I killed the enemies of the French. I mean, I don't know how they ended up in my period. house. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, yeah, bodies end up in houses sometimes, guys. That was kind of his whole thing. Yeah. It's like, come on, guys. Well, and, had and, he like lived in another time period, there's no way it would have extended this long because it's like, oh, this is a time period of like, you know, war and stuff. It's cool, no problem. Yeah, well, yeah, it was the perfect cover for him. And then he kind of claimed he was framed and like, oh no, other people uh, must have put those bodies in my house and stuffed them in the chimney and tried to melt them with lye. And I then mean, he would. I hate it when that happens. <laughs> quick climb. That yeah, that's that wasn't me. And then he would tell people all of these stories can be collaborated by this res- French resistance leader and this French resistance leader and this and unfortunately all of those guys had been killed yeah so you know so they couldn't collaborate did that. they also quote go to Argentina unquote. no no they'd been killed by Nazis <laughs> oh well <laughs> you know <laughs> I mean they they were publicly they had <laughs> they, been publicly those ones were actually like executed like, yeah. and different things as they were found <laughs> they, from a resistance standpoint they were just put to death they, they weren't actually disappeared yeah, they didn't disappear on their own like the, the the Nazis made sure they didn't disappear. Yeah. There was a Nazi plot to try to th- try to uncover this pipeline that was getting people out of the country. Did you re- hear about that one? No, go on. I think it was the Gestapo or 
some part of the the Nazi uh, military, they had heard about this and they had actually got a Jewish guy and coerced him to go and, you know, put feelers out that he was trying to get out. The doctor had some of his drug addicted patients kind of having their ear out for people that were doing this. And that's how he would bring these people in is, you know, people would be listening people at the bar. How can I get out of town? Well, I've got a way, you know, I'm kind of one of those things. Mm -hmm. Well, this Jewish man that was working not by his choice for the Nazis was actually, you know, he had told some people and they got the information and the doctor, they got him the doctor's name and they made the connections. And so the Nazis actually found out about his system about, you know, the disappearing, about how he's getting people out. And they were thinking originally it was happening. They were actually going to they, Argentina. They were thinking that these people are going to Argentina and they're trying to do that. But from what they said with that, when the Nazis actually did it and came in and kind of interrogated him, questioned him, they let him go. <laughs> there was probably no proof anyone went to Argentina. <laughs> Well, I think like, that's oh, we're it. We're good, we're good. And, and I think on the other end, and they didn't say this directly, but I think on the other end, he was helping them do the things they were doing with the undesirables. Exactly. He was, he was, he was killing and dispo- disposing, disposing them. Yeah, disposing them. And disposing And that was people. part of, you know, the Nazi thing was to, to kill not only Jews, but gypsies, um, you know, and anybody that had people that they anybody didn't feel... Anybody fleeing from the Germans? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if if you're trying to get away, we don't want you to. Yeah, and he, he took care of it. So that was kind of interesting that he even he even got away from the Nazis. I mean, they even kind of busted his, his little scheme. Yeah, so kind of like if the Nazis, you know... Find out about what you're doing and, and then decide, oh, that's okay. And don't take and shoot you. They must be thinking you're kind of working on their side. Anyway, kind of interesting for that part. So if not- you're bad enough for the Nazis to think you're bad, I mean, that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> yeah, but they didn't do anything to stop it. It's like joining their team. True. Right. Yeah, it's kind of nuts. I mean, the way that they found all these bodies, he wasn't immediately arrested, right? Like he fled. Mm-hmm. And it sounds like he went into hiding with one of his patients. But he had a lot of people around him that I think were either willing to vouch for him or at least not uh, not out him for what he was doing, including, I mean, he was married. We, t- you know, we mentioned that a little bit, I think. But his wife was likely a co-conspirator as she was profiting from all of this. $250,000 per pop <laughs> and... Uh, and, but- du- and double billing for medical, you know... Yeah. Well- uh, Care, geez. And that was just the getting out of town. That wasn't anything else they had cashed out and bringing with them. Yeah. That was the entrance fee, not not everything that they may have brought with them. Yeah, so you could see how, I guess, with enough with well, enough money and enough drugs, you can hide for a while. Yep. Well, he, he'd spent a lifetime in self promotion too, and he really did have apparently a lot of a lot of fans out there among the general public and people that believed his stories that he was a real resistance fighter. Yeah. So they did try to hide him as a, you know, as a, as a hero. Yeah, it sounds like once they finally captured him, put him on trial, he was charged with 27 murders, but he claimed he killed a total of 63 Germans and collaborators because, you know, they were all bad guys. And he was taking yeah, that's, our, that's all he killed was collaborators 63 and Germans. Between, between the years 1940 and 1945. He was found guilty of the 27 murders and 99 other criminal charges and was sentenced to death by guillotine. And he was sentenced to death on May 25th, 1945. And his his last words, I don't know why I find these funny. Gentlemen, I ask you not to look. This will not be very pretty. <laughs> well, the interesting thing I found was it came to his execution. As they said, he just seemed so nonchalant about it, like he didn't even care. He wasn't worried. I mean, this man was so psychopathic. He had no feels for anything, even himself. He's just like, hey, guys, it's going to be a messy. See ya. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I had a good run. And I do have to <laughs> go back to his wife. If you were his wife, wouldn't you be like sleeping with one eye open? I mean, wouldn't you be afraid to make you mad? Yeah, I mean, he already he was already involved with another woman who mysteriously vanished in a trunk. <laughs> Maybe he's not someone that gets mad. He's just someone that kind of murders you and gets even. Yeah, he might be. He might be a little more sneaky. But yeah, yeah, but there's a lot of like serial killers or whatever that like the wife joins in because it's like they become like 
obsessed or very like attached to this person and they would do anything for them. So maybe it's one of those mindsets. Yeah. And oftentimes they feed off each other. They didn't maybe really say that so much. Maybe she was just as crazy. Yeah. Do you think the, uh, the 63 people that he admitted to killing to was a form of confession for him where I'm sure he was keeping tabs, right? Like crazy people do stuff like that. He's like, yeah, he charged me 27, but I would tell you. It's 63. I killed 63, but they were all bad guys, so I'm innocent. <laughs> right? I, my take would be that that's probably his count. Yeah, I would think so. He probably And he probably wanted people to to know, but not at the same time. I think he wanted the, the notoriety, the infamy that came with it, but at the same time was still able to claim... That he was doing it all for yeah, the glory the of France and the resistance. The resistance. But yeah. <laughs> Okay, that was well, awesome. He wanted, <laughs> he wanted that money. I mean, apparently he got over like $2 million doing all that. Oh, yeah. You know, you just think of the numbers. If he's getting 250000 from even half of the people that oh, yeah. that he that were there and dead. Yeah, plus all the jewelry plus, and the gold yeah. and everything else they brought with them to start a new life in a new country. Jeez Louise. So, yeah, I'll bet there's some bad juju associated with, with Mr. Marcel Petiot. And the I, I read there was a, the, there's actually a French movie that uh, was released in 1990 about uh, his uh, life during the World War II years. I'd like I'd like to see if there's a copy of that available. Maybe do you remember what it titles. was? Do you remember what it was called? Doctor Petio. <laughs> with, with accent. <laughs> Well, my grandfather was a full-blooded Frenchman. I was about to say, our one French viewer is now unsubscribed. (laughs) (laughs) I did take French in junior high because I had a crush on the French teacher. Aw, that's cute. Which, what better reason? That's right. This is not the first time we've done a podcast about a serial killer. And you might ask, you're a paranormal podcast. Why on earth are you doing serial killers? We're not a true crime podcast. But the thing about it is you think about just how heavy... You know, just all the horrible things that this man did and all the body parts down in his basement, you know, so there's obviously dismemberment. And it would, I, don't, I mean, is, the, is that house still standing? Is the building still there? Serial killers, just because of what they do, are just a magnet for, you know, troubled dark spirits, stuff. dark spirits. I mean, he probably had type threes, you know, evil spirits around him. Um, I mean, that's just a hotbed for some paranormal activity. You've probably left a trail of negative energy and horrible residual energy everywhere he went. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder, too, what happens, like, when he dies, like, you know, is he around? Um, Does he have, like, feelings or does he cause negative energy now? Is he, you know, what does he turn into? I don't know. Yeah, or does he move through something... I kind of envision people like this might be a little bit like in the movie Ghost, where you remember Ooh, the yeah. guy that the guy that uh, actually killed Patrick Swayze when he got killed, where those black things came and grabbed and pulled him down to hell. I, I thought that was kind of cool. That's what I hope. I was a little worried you were going <laughs> to reference the pottery scene. Well, there's that too. <laughs> oh, the evil oh, part I, of Ghost. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not the, not the romantic for days Ghost. After the pottery scene, that was horrible. Oh, the yeah. embrace yeah. from behind and everything. Creepy. Oh, yeah. When we were watching that documentary, yeah. <laughs> yeah Brad's just stuff. shaking her head. <sighs> we talk about that there are the our type twos. That there's the the ones that are coerced, and then there's the ones that were just really awful people at this point and I, I think that there's maybe some people not crossing over into the next realm and some people maybe not wanting to go but I think some people some entities some spirits may not really have much of a choice if they've done things way beyond right so what I want to kind of throw out there is to our listeners we've got listeners all over the world uh huh um, seriously, all over the world. I was actually kind of surprised at that. I joke that we've got, you know, our four listeners, and that's kind of a running joke we do every once in a while. But we actually um, have a pretty good audience. And if any of you are in France, or will be going to France, find this person's house. Go there. Even if you have to be like creepy stock, which we have done before, um, and just stand across the street, put out your feels, take your equipment. I want to know. Yeah. Or if you've ever been there, let us know. Yeah, if you've Post been there. Post a picture. There, send us a picture. Um, send us a picture. 
I mean, maybe the building's gone, and maybe there's a post office there now or something, but go stand there. But, What's you know, French, French, Paris is so old uh, that there's a lot of buildings that survived the war. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. You were just in London, and how many buildings there predate the war that you were... I mean, a yeah. lot of them, right? Well, yeah, a lot of them were rebuilt, but... Yeah, they, because of the bombing, but right, there's but also the a lot there. of the structures that were there, and so there's a, there's a good possibility that a lot of that the building may still be standing. Can you imagine being the guy that the fourth or fifth or sixth guy that's rented this and doesn't know all of the <laughs> stuff that's going on in that house? He doesn't understand why pea soup shoots out of his toilet. That's hard to say. <laughs> pea soup shoots out of his toilet. What is this? Yeah, it would be interesting to. No, yeah. go, we'll just go give him this podcast. Give this a listen. Perfect. Here's a realtor's number. <laughs> Here's well, our growing n- up, Here's I had number. like this. I had this thought of like, there's eventually going to be running out of room where people didn't die. Like, I started having that thought. Like, when I grow up and I get my own house, like someone's probably died in it because there's no other houses left. Like, like, I don't know. I'm having a squirrel moment. Jess, your microphone makes all these pretty colors. Yeah, um, I can also lightly ta- uh, touch the top and it goes mute. So I love it. I need but, yeah, that the pretty colors. Yeah. <laughs> Send me a link. Okay. It's, it's pretty. <laughs> For sure. I mean, and the sound quality is not bad either. Okay. Just throwing it out there. Back, 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 <laughs> back to our podcast. Uh, but the lights are fabulous. I'm, I'm easily just. Dis- my name is Raven. I'm easily distracted by shiny things. True. Okay. All right. Well, that <laughs> was an shiny. interesting main topic. Stay spooky, my haunty friends. Have a good one. Hey, good night. Bye. See you next time. You've been listening to The Supernatural Hour at AdvancedParanormal.com. The Supernatural Hour is part of the Radio Ronin Network found at RadioRonin.com. Copyright by Advanced Paranormal Services.